yesterday's thoughts on flavor, you know, if this was a semester course, then you'd like to do some case, case study to make all the philosophical statements seem like they actually matter in the heat of battle. Um, what do I mean by battle? I mean, you're at the, you're watching LHC data or some other collider and some interesting anomaly occurs. It's not completely clear whether it's experimental error, theoretical uncertainty, uh, new physics. And there's a question of how you react or what you would contemplate playing with as a model if it's new physics, what correlations you should look for with other channels and so on and so on. So, so that's what a case study would look like. And I wanted like, to quickly illustrate where flavor, where these flavor considerations would suddenly show up. Um, so I'm going to try and do all of that in five minutes um, by starting with the answer, by starting with the model, which is not the way it will happen in real life. You'll be faced with data and you'll have to work backwards. But let me start with the model and it's part of what I will try and sort of a way of thinking that I think is useful and systematic and I'll try to state it more systematically in tomorrow's lecture. So here it is. The model is I'm going to add very little to the standard model. I'm not trying to solve any problems right now. I'm adding particles to probe how much I can have flavor dependent interactions without running afoul of the incredibly powerful set of flavor constraints that I briefly alluded to yesterday. So here's an example of um, particles called diquarks. And to give this example, I'm just going to say, imagine a scalar phi with the quantum numbers, the standard model quantum numbers of, say, an upright quark, okay? An up, a, an up handed, a right handed up type quark. But it's a scalar. Now, of course, you can think squark if you want, but I don't insist that you take a Susy view of it. It's just, I'm going to point to something special <laughs> that happens in this case. Um, now let's ask, so, so don't think of it as Susy because that will make you think about our parity and this, that, and the other, which are not essential to Susy, but it biases your thinking based on the literature. Let's just ask, how can I make it couple in a way which depends on flavor? Namely, it has to talk to the standard model quarks, okay? Um, so if this is a, since it's a triplet of color, um, in fact, given the hypercharge, you can see that, 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 that there's, if you just think about it, there's just one way to do it. So here's a color index. Here is the scalar. This is a scalar that I make with the spin indices here. And here are some flavor indices, generation indices, and here are the color indices. And the color is hooked up as a color singlet in this way, okay? And this is the only way to hook it up. And so the coupling constants of this thing depend on these generational indices, i and j, and this is it. This is, this is the renormalizable, the leading coupling that you can contemplate writing down for this guy. Um, now, here's the interesting thing as far as flavor is concerned. The gauge quantum numbers of this particle have completely forced my hand in what to write down. In particular, in this case, not because I want it, but accidentally, this is anti-symmetric in these flavor indices, okay? So I'm just going to give you a baby version of a series of studies of the magical properties of diquark with respect to flavor and CP that's in a paper I wrote with several colleagues in the spirit of tracking down in a systematic way the best bets from the flavor point of view for new physics, okay? So this thing is accidentally anti-symmetric in flavor. Now I'm going to give you a baby version of the analysis we did, which is just to point out what kind of process could you get here. So naively, we could repeat the exercise of yesterday 
and we could have you know so something that looked like uh, so if time is running this way we could have something that looked like this you could you could imagine that but in fact if this is not d bar d this is dd so in fact it, it really looks like this um, s bar d comes in s bar uh, sorry sd comes in and sd comes out um, in fact, play around with it. If I just, if I just uh, stuck to a two-generation model, to keep it simple, imagine there was not a third generation. You could still talk about flavor-changing neutral currents, but this could not mediate one, okay? In fact, in a two-generation model, something anti-symmetric in generation number is necessary, necessarily a flavor s singlet, a singlet of flavor symmetries. So it cannot, it's not that I've tuned its couplings so that it does not, vi does not mediate flavor changing neutral currents. It is algebraically in incapable of mediating flavor changing neutral currents, okay? You should compare this, uh, you can do this yourself. If I just add a second Higgs, so compare with a second Higgs, Higgs prime. Now, many of you see the second Higgs coming from supersymmetric models where there's some extra structure forced on you by supersymmetry. But suppose you just say, no, I'm giving you the quantum numbers of a new Higgs. Uh, the new Higgs has got the same quantum numbers as the standard model Higgs. And I just write non-supersymmetrically any old couplings I want here and here. Just check for yourself that you will have disastrous levels if you just anarchically choose these couplings at order one. You will have disastrous levels of uh, flavor changing neutral currents because you can turn anti-strange into strange. Okay, it's easy to do, okay, and you can work out many other examples. So there's something special, if you like, about diquarks in that regard. In fact, if in, our, in our paper, we say, okay, fine, you might say, gosh, the tree level thing is okay, and you did this two, two generation toy example. But in fact, if you do the three generation one, or electric dipole moments from complex values of this coupling and so on and so on, you find that it has this magical degree of safety as long as you do one thing. As long as you assume that this matrix is hierarchical. Hierarchical, what do I mean? If I take this to be 10 to the minus 9, I'm safe? No. I just mean that some of its elements are order 1. There's typically a dominant element. But the others are much smaller. In other words, that very much fits with this wave function overlap picture of flavor structure. So which is it? Which, since it's anti-symmetric, it could be that the, the big element is 1, 2. It could be the biggest element is 1, 3. Or it could be the biggest element is 2, 3. We study all the cases. In a sense, at the LHC, the most dramatic thing about having a big coupling to fermions like this is that you could have this process where you produce a single resonance. You're, you're not pair producing this phi using its color interactions. You could even singly produce it. But that would imply that you had, since the, since the dominant partons in the, in the proton are first and second generation, that would require, for this to be a big coupling, that would actually require that the dominant coupling here, the order one coupling here, is the one, two element, the first and second generations. This seems to be different from the pattern, the hierarchical pattern we see in the scalar case, in the, in the case of the, uh, the Higgs scalar, okay, where it's the three, three elements that are the biggest. That is how we're perfectly consistent with the general wave function overlap picture. It, which, which elements of this matrix are dominant? The general rule is hierarchy, but which guy is the hierarchically the biggest depends very much on the placement of these fields in extra dimensions. Um, so you can go through all the cases. They're all interesting phenomenologically as possibilities, and it's kind of a repertoire of tools that you keep ready for some anomaly to show up. Okay. But even the one, two, which looks like it might be dangerous because the first and second generations are the best tested in some sense, um, is remarkably safe. Okay. Now, therefore, you can imagine producing it singly, you can imagine pair producing it 
and then looking at these as decay modes. And of course, it's interesting to think that the third generation might show up and so on. Um, as I said, I want to think of it as a kind of a tool for chasing anomalies. And indeed, the Tevatron, as you may have heard, well, it produced a couple of anomalies that captured a lot of attention. Let me just quickly mention one, and that's the, uh, the so-called uh, forward backward asymmetry of the top core, okay? Um, which is something that in principle you can probe both at the LHC, but is sort of rather easier to understand given the P, P bar, the proton antiproton nature of scattering at, at the Tevatron. But, but basically this forward backward asymmetry, which is small in the standard model, seem to be coming out big experimentally. What do you do? What do you do in a situation like that? Well, you start to say, what Feynman diagrams, what new physics could I at attack it with? You, of course, start talking to your QCD buddies and uh, standard model precision calculators and saying, you know, maybe the standard model calculation is wrong. You are trying to find both the gossip, the rumor, on the theoretical side in terms of calculating the right answer in the standard model as well as in terms of experimental technique. And then just maybe it's actually new physics. And you ask, does it resonate with this or that? If you're very tied to Susie, then you're going to look with Susie colored glasses at everything. If you're very tied to our parody Susie, you'll look with those glasses. You'll always be tied. If you have a full repertoire, you speak a little, you, you think a little more generally if you can. Now, just, ju I'm not saying this is a beautiful fit to what we now understand, and basically this is an unsolved mystery, so we understand zip, but, but let me say the kind of thing that one can do, because I don't have time to play it out, is the standard model, of course, produces top anti-top with just, say, the first generation quarks inside the proton, but if you have new physics, then this process can interfere with something that looks like this, a T-channel exchange of something like this phi. But for a T-channel exchange to produce something that can interfere with this, it's kind of crazy because there's going to have to be one, three, one, three, okay? So you're going to have to have a die quark which has a very odd <laughs> a hierarchical structure if you think of the prototype as being the Higgs which likes to couple to the second and third generations mostly, this thing is going to have to be dominantly first and third generation. Sort of crazy kind of structure if that's the biggest kind of coupling. Nevertheless, the flavor properties that you can study just from this sort of accidental structure forced on you by gauge invariance allows this to be pretty significant. You can play with it. So I'm not saying this is the answer to that anomaly. I'm not even saying you know, depending on who you ask, people have a different impression of the data um, and how seriously to take it. But it's the kind of sort of, even these bad rumors which go away are like, they force you to go through the process, sharpening your claws for the, the real attack. Um, and any, 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 any rumor <laughs> might turn out to be the real thing. And you're sort of gauging whether the new physics that you have to use to make things happen is plausible or not plausible, and whether you would therefore think that the experiment is nonsense or not nonsense. So, so there's a lot of back and forth. In some sense, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. You really feel you're in the heat of, as I say, the, the battle. Um, if you want to know more about A forward backward asymmetries, even in the standard model, you can see the discussion in Peskin and easily see what's so special about these asymmetries in pulling out the interesting structure in new physics. Why are they such a great um, filter for new physics. Okay, so that was the end of yesterday's discussion. No mention has been made up to that point about uh, strong coupling, but I now want to uh, switch to introducing strong coupling. So there are many such exercises that one can do, and I'm just giving you the, a quick one. Um, so I want to switch to strong coupling, okay? So given that there's a lot of discussion about, in, in my lecture as well as other, other lectures about grand unification, um, I'm about to mention grand unification, but completely in the context for the moment of an analogy to where I'm going, okay? So pretend we have, we have no interest in the real world for a second. I want to imagine just, sorry, 
We have no interest in, here, let me make the case. I am making an analogy, that's all I'm saying, here. Now, in this analog world, I want to consider the standard model that emerges from some non-supersymmetric grand unification. Okay, that's it. Well, everybody knows that in a grand unified theory, the 3, 2, 1 gauge structure is enhanced to some bigger gauge group, like SU5, which contains new gauge bosons, X and Y gauge bosons. So here is an X gauge boson, okay? And these things mediate weird interactions. So here is one. Positron, down quark, I'll sort of, the, 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 the direction, I guess, I'll try to be careful about. They carry color, so that's allowing them to do that. And then there's U, U. Okay, so here's the kind of weird interaction this can mediate. And the mass of this X guy is somewhere way up there, 10 to the 14 GeV or something, okay? Now, of course, the famous thing that this does, if it's there, is it allows the proton to decay. And we can say, how does that happen? Well, if I just throw in this sort of spectator up quark, and I think of time as running in this way, then you can have various gluons attaching like this. And basically, this thing here looks like the wave function of a proton. And it looks like I can decay into a positron and, say, a, a pion. Okay? So, proton decay. This is what it's famous for. But I want to read this thing in a slightly different way. I want to use this interaction in a slightly different way. And if there was unification, what I'm about to say would just be true. Okay? There's nothing pretend about it in that sense. Um, I want to take that interaction. So here's my positron. I want to look at energies of order the positron. I want to look at the, the, mo the momentum being close to this on-shell condition for being a positron. And then this process can appear in a kind of virtual sense in the following way. Where this is uh, u, u, b. Okay, and then you can have lots of gluons here dressing it up. Um, and then you can have the x guy there, and you can go to positron, and then, and then you can do it again. So consider this propagator correction to the positron, okay? So what it looks like is like, so if you just look at this, this intermediate state here, it looks like it's like protons, if you take confinement into account, it's proton or protons, excited proton or whatever it is, okay? Just, if, if confinement is true, the intermediate states that are possible here are just, ex are just baryons. And so what you're looking at in diagrammatic language is that the positron, once you have this sort of proton decay operator interaction, the positron, which of course cannot decay any further, it's the lightest guy, but it's mixing with baryons and we're actually seeing the ham-handed way in which perturbation theory is capturing mixing between the positron and the proton. You cannot any longer say that the mass eigenstate of the lowest fermion, the lowest charge one fermion, is just a lepton, or the mass eigenstate is just a composite. It's actually an admixture of the two, okay? So that, if you want, the experimental, the experimental positron, I'll put it in quotes, is basically an elementary particle, the, um, the hypothetical standard model positron, um, plus, I mean, so it's approximately, let's drop this interaction, it's a weak interaction, suppressed by mx squared, 
So, so roughly it's the same thing, but then there are these epsilonic corrections, let me call it epsilon proton, that in fact it's a composite proton plus, of course there you can various mixing angles, it could be a, um, a composite excited proton as well, okay, et cetera. So the experimental object is no longer just elementary or composite, it's, it's an admixture of the two, okay? So this is a real effect, except we can calculate, so you should think of this epsilon as a kind of a mixing angle, so it's like sine of theta, cos theta is roughly one because the theta is small, and so this is the sort of mixing angle theta, if you like. Um, how big is that angle? Well, um, not hard to see that the mixing angle has to be suppressed by mx squared, and the only other relevant scale is the proton mass scale or the compositeness scale. And so uh, this epsilon uh, p, or any of these p's, the epsilon p star or whatever it is, it goes like lambda qcd, the hadronic scale or the mass of the proton, over mx squared, okay? One GV. 10 to the 14 GV, so this interesting thing is so much smaller than one that uh, we don't really care, okay? But this idea that the mass eigenstates do not allow you to diagonalize compositeness, if you like, whether it's elementary or compositeness, this is called partial compositeness, okay? Um, so. Okay, um, but it does seem a little boring at this level, okay? Now, suddenly you think, wait a second, I'm not supposed, so as I said, in effective field theory, we don't have to write this boson, it's just some four fermion operator in effective field theory, but we've sort of just treated it at tree level, but really to do it all right, we're gonna have to consider the dressing by QCD, okay? There can be these kinds of dressings, I guess not between the positron, but whatever. Okay, so how do we take into account that? Well, this is a standard part of our technology as field theorists, um, namely to use the renormalization group. And so you inherit this operator just below the scale mx as an effective operator, and then this effective operator has to be run from the gut scale down all the way to the GV scale before this little story plays out, before confinement kicks in and you can think of it as mass mixing as opposed to just some nonlinear interaction. But could something big happen because of all this running? Well, we sort of know the uh, uh, schematic form of them. You can do this in greater detail, but the schematic form of this is that when we get down to the GV scale or lambda QCD scale, and we've done this kind of running, you, you, you don't get just, uh, it'll contain an operator that looks like this E. So this is the operator that you would just naively get in this four fermion uh, uh, version, but it would get multiplied by some sort of running, okay? If there's several operators, it's some matrix, but, but to keep it simple, the kind of, the generic kind of thing is running that has this kind of form. And um, whatever it is, uh, GEV to MX there, and um, some order one group theory, blah, blah, blah factors, and then a loop factor, alpha, at mu prime over four pi, where this is alpha strong, so QCD, okay? And this is, of course, what we call an anomalous dimension, you know, gamma or some an anomalous dimension. In the language of the renormalization group, okay? Now, does it give you a big, is it a, is it a big deal? 
Um, we use this kind of technology all the time and going from the weak scale down to the scale at which we do flavor tests. We're just reusing that technology. But is it a really big deal? Well, here's the thing about the strong interaction. We're looking for magic from strong dynamics. Well, we do have strong dynamics. It's QCD in this case. Um, on the other hand, QCD is very weakly coupled, or rather, it is pretty weakly coupled above one GeV. That's called asymptotic freedom. So most of this time in running here, this alpha is pretty weak. And this is just some sort of pathetic logarithmic modulation of the basic tree level answer. So if you care about several decimal place precision, then you better do it. But if you're just trying to get a big picture, this is just a detail. Who cares, okay? And the reason is because the theory is mostly perturbative. Even what we call the strong interactions are mostly asymptotically free in the regime of interest. And so there's not much damage or change that this thing brings in terms of the ballpark of how important this is or how big this mixing angle turns out to be, okay? So in, in a sense, all that happens when you unpack that thing in perturbation theory is you just get this, logs, some logs modulating this answer. So what? It's still incredibly small. We don't care. So the magic of strong dynamics that I want to talk about comes when you have strongly coupled, strong but over a large hierarchy in energies. Not just strong at one GV, but imagine now, switching to some hypothetical strong dynamics, which is strong over a large range of energies, then what can these anomalous dimensions do? Um, so first, is it plausible to be strong? Is it theoretically plausible that you could be strongly coupled over a large hierarchy of scales? Well, it's plausible from our general understanding of the structure of quantum field theories, where if you look at the space of couplings, the way this can, be, can happen is that a central feature, this, the simplest aspect of renormalization group flow is when there's no flow, when you have what's called a fixed point of the renormalization group, the beta functions vanish. And this can happen at strong coupling, somewhere away from zero coupling or perturbative coupling. You can have this. And so consider a renormalization group flow, which is like this. Here is the renormalization group flow. These are couplings, G1, G2, G17, okay? And the beta function I'm going to draw by saying how fast, as you move through decades of energy, how fast do you move on this curve? Well, when you're far from the fixed point, you're moving pretty healthily at a healthy clip. As you're approaching this fixed point, you might slow down because at the fixed point, you don't move at all. That's what a fixed point is. But something pushes you a little bit away from this fixed point, and so eventually you speed up again, okay? So it's possible that for a long time, by which I mean a long hierarchy of scales, you are being controlled by this fixed point to be at strong coupling and, um, approximately unchanging over a large hierarchy. All of a sudden, so that is a plausible story if you want to see more about sort of how this fits in with our understanding of condensed matter phenomena and so on and so on. You can at least start with Peskin and references therein under the critical phenomena and renormalization group ideas. Um, but there's certainly other places to look. But we can see what's going to happen here. Look at this. Look at this anomalous dimension. Strong coupling, this alpha over four pi factor can be order one. That's what it means to be strongly coupled, okay? Again, it's asymptotic freedom that spoils the story in the real sort of QCD case. But in some hypothetical theory where you're strongly coupled over a large hierarchy from here to here before things suddenly happen and the theory blows up and confines, then this whole thing could be order one. So you're integrating exponential, if it's order one and approximately constant, then you can do this, okay? 
you're exponentiating the log of mx over gv with some order one exponent, okay? And so all of a sudden, this thing can have a, um, uh, something that looks like, um, so let me call it not QCD, it's not the real world QCD, it's some compositeness scale. to some order one number, which however, unfortunately, is determined by strong dynamics. So it's a so-called critical exponent in the language of condensed matter physics, okay? And all of a sudden, it is possible that you might, the, the, the net thing here, might just be a fractional power, right? It might be lambda over m, the net thing here might be lambda over m to the one-fifth, okay? you're very sensitive to those exponents. Even order one exponents, which are just a little bit small, can give you interesting hierarchies where it's small compared to one, but it's not ridiculously small compared to one, okay? Then all of a sudden, we might care. Okay. So this is the idea of partial compositeness and how it blends with the idea of these strong theories which are strong over a hierarchy. Um, what happens, you might say, if this is an order one exponent, this net thing, it could be smaller than one, it could even be bigger than one. Something that naively starts off as being highly suppressed by mx, when all is said and done, might be enhanced by mx. In that case, this mixing effect or this interaction, instead of getting more and more irrelevant in the infrared, becomes more and more relevant in the infrared. If that happens, the positron, this mixing angle, goes through the roof. If you becomes order one, and the strong and and, and the and the, posit the the sort of separation of positron, pure positron and pure proton, breaks down completely, and the positron becomes part of the strong dynamics, because <laughs> the coupling to the strong dynamics becomes order one. If I'm strongly coupled to a strongly coupled dynamics, then I am part of that strongly coupled dynamics. So there's sort of two things that can happen. Either you're weakly coupled and you have small mixing angles, or this particle from outside the strong dynamics merges and becomes part of a new strong dynamics that then that either, well, may continue into the infrared. Okay, so what can we do with this idea? Well, let's put it together with this idea that we want strong dynamics. We want to explore a classic possibility. Um, that the Higgs boson is a composite of some new strong dynamics, okay? Just in the spirit, but maybe not the detail, of how the pion is a composite of QCD, okay? A sort of classic idea that was uh, created by George Ian Kaplan, and you can still read those papers and make sense of them. Um, so let's try and sketch out how to, how to push on such an idea. Well, if that's true, that the Higgs boson is one of the composites itself, there's a very interesting way in which Yukawa couplings come out. Let's imagine that all the fermions of the standard model, just to start the case, all the fermions of the standard model are actually elementary particles, like that positron. And they only can talk to the Higgs, which is a composite of the strong dynamics, by mixing with the strong sector. So that diagrammatically, we say, that there is some strong dynamics operator which creates fermionic excitations of the strong dynamics, which mixes with these elementary particles, so the standard model fermions. Let me say standard model fermion of species I. And the Higgs boson is also some, is put together by the strong dynamics. So here's the Higgs. In 
And so you can have the standard model can get Yukawa couplings, that is effective operators in an effective standard model coming from this standard model uh, left-handed particle and the right-handed particle seeing the VEV of this uh, scalar both the scalar composite, okay? Well, what does that tell you? It says that the effective Yukawa coupling in the standard model, in the effective standard model, um, is going to go, so first of all, so let me, let me say it like this, um, we need to figure out how strong this is. Here are three strongly interacting particles interacting. You might guess that their coupling is four pi to be strongly coupled. Why? Because trilinear couplings, which are four pi strong, if you do loops, there's no suppression because the 16 pi squareds get canceled by four pi squared, okay? So this is sort of the dumbest and not bad if you think about experimental data, picture of the going rate for, st for st purely strongly interacting composites with each other. So as a kind of scrappy estimate, you'd say that's four pi, but then I have to put in these mixing angles to get to the sort of positrons of my story, which are the standard model fermions themselves. And so I should multiply by some sort of epsilon i, epsilon j, one for the sort of right-handed species or up right-handed species and Q left-handed species and so on. And you see, except for this four pi, right, we've ended up exactly at the structure that I was saying looks a little bit like the data or that comes out of the sort of wave function overlap picture um, uh, that I discussed yesterday, okay? so. So we're back to that. That's one of the attractions of this picture. Um, now, in a little bit more detail, you know, I sometimes tell my students that if you're any sort of a hack, you can win a Nobel Prize, but if you're truly brilliant, you have to find an unobvious small parameter and uh, a new expansion parameter to do field theory, okay? So Tuft, who did win a Nobel Prize, um, also came up with a large N expansion. I'm dealing with strong interactions. I have no way of seeing anything in this kind of story. And so when the number of colors, let's call these things not to mix up with ordinary color, let's call it hypercolor. When the number of colors is large, you can do a kind of um, expansion, the large N expansion. And in that expansion, you would really view this as, as, as sort of four pi, and it becomes weaker than totally strong by sort of a factor like this. So if you want to read more about that way of thinking, you can certainly look at Coleman's Aspects of Symmetries lectures on the large N expansion, or I really like this introduction in Witten's um, paper on baryons in the one over N expansion he talks about the meson picture in his introduction or introductory couple of uh, sections. And it's a very physical and beautiful way of sort of thinking of where this picture came from, okay? Um, so this, the quick slogan is, with large numbers of colors, the interquark forces can be maximally strong and yet, the interhadron forces or intermeson forces can be parametrically weaker, okay? So these, all the, all the strong interactions are used up to make the hadron and the residual van der Waals force between different hadrons is weak and we can use that as our expansion parameter. Who would have guessed, okay? So that's one of the expansion parameters of today's lectures. And so, fine, so as a kind of going rate, and this is the problem with strong dynamics. You say, well, what if n hypercolor was not so big? What am I gonna do then? Well, fine, putts along as best you can, but to some extent, we're being forced to look under the lamppost um, of where we can say something sane, something about possible new strong dynamics that might nevertheless 
inconvenient as it might be, show up in nature, okay? Um, and, and you can read the, well, the paper on the reading list if you want to think about leptons, okay, which I won't do here. Um, the fact that we now need, so here are standard model particles, or species I, and the plot of this whole story is that they have to multiply operators of some new strong dynamics with fermionic quantum numbers, and this has to be a, a standard model gauge invariant. So these things, of course, carry 3, 2, 1 quantum numbers. So the operators here, the composite operators, have to carry 3, 2, 1 quantum numbers. And that means that the things that are making up these composite operators, the hyperquarks and hypergluons of this strong dynamics, they actually must carry standard model quantum numbers. But that, that stands to reason, okay? Um, so that means that there's another kind of operator that has to be in the game. If the hyperquarks carry standard model quantum numbers under gauge, gauge charges, then you also have to have in your Lagrangian, not only this, you're also forced to have standard model gauge fields gauging conserved currents of So there have to be global symmetries of the strong dynamics which get gauged by the standard model, and those, they, they have to have conserved currents. So there are these other operators that better be there in the theory, okay? So we're learning a little bit about this theory. <laughs> it's got these operators, it's got these operators. It's not a lot to go on, but let's see if we can keep putzing along, okay? Um, and in the large end approximation, that tells us some of the kinds of states that you have to have. In the large end approximation, again, look at Coleman's lectures, these operators, when acting on the vacuum, create mesons. They interpolate meson states, and so they could be fermionic, in quotes, mesons, mesinos, mezzaninos, whatever it is, um, uh, and, and, and uh, bosonic ones. This would be analogs of the rho meson. Okay, um, so what's the new physics here? Forget what problem I solved, except, except saying something interesting about getting back the structure of flavor physics. Um, it would be really cool to see these new composites. Well, we've, apparently we've seen one of them. It's called the Higgs boson, okay? Is it feasible? Let's ask, is it feasible that I can see some more composites, like, like some of these guys? Okay. So that would be nice, but let's ask, we always have this problem. Whatever new physics you would like to see in the future, you can ask, why haven't I seen it in virtual effects in the past in precision tests? So we've got to ask whether it is sane to expect to see these guys under any circumstances. Okay. So, we have to ask, are we within striking distance of being able to produce these composites? Remember, we do have a sort of, you know, why did we see the Higgs composite first? Well, if it's something like a Goldstone boson you, of, of the strong dynamics, like a pion, you would have expected a picture where the generic composite state is sort of up here, so generic, at some scale lambda compositeness, and then, some, for some reason, the Higgs is much lighter, like exactly like a, the pion is in nature, okay? So naturally, we've come across this first, but, but can we be in striking distance of this? Let's ask that question. And um, the answer is, with just armed with the large N expansion and these kind of small parameters, we can go at it and make some quick estimates. We can do a little bit better in a second, but we can make some quick estimates and um, the terrible thing is it's close and not close enough, okay? So, so that's frustrating, but let's see what I mean. By the way, these are only estimates, so when I say close, maybe, maybe it's better than that. Um, and that, that's just the fact of where we live now, okay? So. Um, so in, so in sort of 
looking at a lot of these, the Contino lectures and Tassi are kind of nice to look at. Um, as far as the two types, well, I think the Contino lectures for the electroweak precision tests. And um, there's a paper by many authors, but the person I know best is Ritazzi, um, on the flavor tests. Um, by the way, I'm giving these references as the useful ones and the last, sometimes the last word on the subject, but they're not the first word on the subject. So if you want credit, you actually have to read the papers. Um, and if your students are out there somewhere in this audience and you're going to get me, I'm saying that. So. But this is a very useful paper for just taking this attitude and just zoom, there's so much data and it's so much fun to work through and see how all of these things play out and sketch this new possible world that we might inhabit very soon, okay? Um, and so there are all sorts of things like the W boson because you have to have, once you have this mixing, you have to have this kind of thing. That means that Ws like this can mix with rho mesons interpolated by this, and these are what are called oblique corrections in electroweak uh, uh, precision theory uh, notation, and they affect the masses of the W at precision level and so on and so on. Many, many uh, precision observables measured at LEP are affected by this, and so you can work through it. Just, just with some basic rules like this, you can go through flavor tests like uh, know, our favorite KK bar mixing operator. Okay, you can do, you can do things like that. The, I, 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 I'll just do one, just so you see the flavor of, pardon the pun, the, the, I'll just do one, one such example. So, for example, one of the things that people look at is this coupling, or if you want, let's just turn it into a coupling, there. Well, the standard model tells you what this coupling is and any radiative corrections and so on and so on. But this theory can modify it. How? Um, here's the Z. Here's B left, B left. But, so, so, so this composite state coming in here has the same quantum numbers as B left. It seems like this is a gauge boson, so all it can tell is the quantum numbers, and so nothing has been, no damage done, okay? But this composite has a healthy coupling, four pi over root n, to turn into the Higgs, which can turn into the vacuum. And then that flips this thing with quantum numbers B left into something with quantum numbers necessarily B right. And so you think you're measuring the Z charge of the B left, but secretly there's some amplitude to be measuring the, the, the charge of the B right, of some composite B right, okay? So you get the wrong answer with some small correction here. And that would be a difference in what you're expecting for this coupling and we measure this coupling and it works pretty well to about a quarter percent precision, okay? The fractional error in this thing, quarter percent. So, so how big is this effect? Well, you can sort of see that other than this sort of epsilons here, everything is sort of four pi over root n kind of thing. And uh, so I'll just be sloppy and you can do it. I've, I've given you all the rules, but, but this sort of delta G, compared to the G that you're expecting in the standard model, would go like, so it's, it's left-handed, left-handed, so there's some sort of epsilon left, or epsilon B left, squared, and then there's this weak, weak scale squared, and again, I'm, I'm gonna be sloppy, but just some lambda comp squared, 
And you say, well, Garb, I don't know what that is. I have no idea what this epsilon left is. Well, you do know something. The top Yukawa, namely 1, top Yukawa of 1, has to come from this 4 pi over root n. And as I'll try to argue later, you should keep in your mind uh, n hypercolor of order 10 or something. In other words, you'd like it to be really big so you have a weak coupling somewhere up your sleeve. But it'll turn out it can't be too big for reasons that we can estimate, okay? So, but, but just keep in your head something like 10 or something. So this, sorry, so, so, so this is something three-ish, okay? And, and then we have this factor. And so there's an epsilon top right and an epsilon top left. By electroweak symmetry, epsilon top left is the same as epsilon bottom left. So let me make that change. And you see, I'm trapped. I got to get this. I want this to be as small as possible. So my best case is to sort of say that this is 1. It's maximal. And then this thing can be, if you like, is root n hypercolor. Okay. And even then, just very sloppily, you end up finding out that this compositeness scale has to be of order 10 TeV, maybe 5 TeV, whatever it is. Okay. It's of order 10 TeV. So this is the spirit of all of these things. They all come out, they all pan out. If you, if you don't play any monkey tricks, beyond the basic ideas, they're all the bounds, the worst of them are all 10 to 20 TeV, okay? But there are some simple tricks to play. There are some things that are not tricks as opposed to there are symmetries and special implementations and so on and so on. And, um, and then you can do better. So the quick summary of all that is, in some sense, these are perhaps the most robust, like I can't see how we could easily change the framework so that those constraints get relaxed. And so, more or less, I would say that these imply that lambda comp, okay, which is in the denominator of all these effects, that, this, this has to, that these are sort of bigger than 3 TeV or so. Okay, going right. But then all of these flavor-dependent things and so on, are basically pointing to lambda comp being bigger than 10 to 20 t TV. And you can relax, my own sense is, these can be relaxed by a clever idea, but in the spirit of Nima's comments like yesterday, how much are you going to gamble that nature is being so clever just so that you have to wait longer, you know, to, 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 to see the new physics, right? So you have to weigh these things, and yet, I have seen in the past that things that look like a clever idea on the day they're invented, after a few years, you look back and you say, oh, I see that was actually a generic possibility in field theory, okay? So unfortunately, you cannot make this an algorithm. You must use your judgment. Model building judgment still has value in the 21st century, okay? Um, so I keep in mind two ways of thinking. Life might be good, by which I mean resonances within the grasp of the LHC. And I'll tell you what physics would look like then. Life might not be so good, just from these constraints, without any considerations of naturalness. This or another. It might not be so good, just out of reach. It, I wouldn't mind if it was 10,000 TeV, because I never missed it, you know. But, <laughs> But this is so, this is very close. You, you almost built the right collider. The other one was canceled, you know? That, that's, that's this scenario. So, so these are the options. I would keep both in mind. The optimistic possibility, the meso-optimistic possibility, and of course there's the complete other possibility, none of this is relevant to the real world, okay? So, so there, there are these options. Um, So, of course, you can, let's try to be a little, let's, let's even believe that this framework is broadly correct. 
and let's try to be a little bit pessimistic. Let's, let's try to say that, in fact, the spectrum looks like this. So, qualitatively, correct. The Higgs, 125 GeV. Okay, we, there, we've got that. So we pegged the, the scale on this picture. But let's suppose that this scale is really high, 1,000 TeV. Is it plausible? How, how should we think about it, okay? Um, so let's try. In fact, the real world has given us a beautiful example of this. So here's a kind of miniature of a lot of these ideas. Um, it's given by QCD plus QED, okay? And you can look at the pi on itself, okay? And I'm not putting in any fermions from the outside or any of that kind of stuff. I'm just considering this theory. And so, the elementary particles I'm pointing to are just gonna be the photon. So the photon has a kind of mixing with rho mesons, it's called photon rho mixing in the strong interactions literature, that comes just from this, okay? So without this, let's put the quark masses to zero, which is reasonable by chiral symmetry. In fact, if there were no electroweak interactions and Yukawa couplings, the quark masses would be zero. So this would be all you'd have, massless QCD. The pion would be exactly massless. But now we have this little intruder from the outside mixing with us, and so maybe the pions get a mass. Let's take the charged pion, okay? In fact, if I knew nothing about compositeness, from the bottom up I discover a charged pion, well below the mass at which compositeness effects give away how it came to be, then I would say there's a charged pion, and then it's got electromagnetic interactions, so there's a diagram like this. And so you would have guessed, by the usual considerations of naturalness, that there are radiative corrections that go like E squared over 16 pi squared, and we would have said the cutoff squared, okay? And then we would all have philosophized, what does the cutoff mean, it's an intermediate step, in, uh, in uh, the renormalized theory, in the renormalized theory, I don't see it, it's just an intermediate step. If I do it in dim reg, maybe it might go away, then maybe I don't have the problem. We could have all of that discussion. Except in this context, there's no discussion. There's no discussion. Because the true picture is here is the pion, and here is my photon. And here are the gluons holding it together. And so we can look at it according, we can view this picture on the wavelength of this virtual photon. When the virtual photon is soft, it cannot resolve all this detail, it looks like this. And so it must basically start building up this, this set of contributions. When the photon is very short wavelength, it doesn't even see a scalar. It just sees quarks and gluons. There's no scalar in the theory. It looks, it's looking like this, okay? There is absolutely no scalar quadratic divergence or anything like that. So that means that once the photon becomes hard enough, as you, remember, you're integrating over photon momentum. Once it becomes hard enough, this picture has to stop. So in fact, what happens is, of course, that dividing wavelength is given by the compositeness scale. So the answer has to actually not be a quadratic divergence, it has to actually just be a finite result like this, okay? Now, we can actually do better than that. There is a very beautiful, so, when you put quark masses in, then you can subtract out the effects of quark masses by just subtracting the mass squared of the neutral pion, okay? So you can actually compare data with theory. This theory is pretty estimating, but there's a really beautiful treatment. If you haven't seen it, you should work through it because it's just great field theory. It's reviewed in Porkorsky uh, and his gauge field theory book, um, which is going through 
how to do this. Not at the level of gluon by gluon, but at the level of all the different hadrons that make up, which are eff effectively equivalent to the quark gluon theory, okay? And uh, so th th that's very nice, take a look, but, but the net result is finite, boom. And so, did naturalness prevail? So naturalness, you'd say that the radiative corrections are, should be comparable to, to, to the actual mass, okay? That the mass should not be that much lighter. And actually, at the order one level, it works. Of course, naturalness was only ever meant to be, at best, a kind of order one predictor of anything. And order one, it actually works, okay? So it's a bang on test of naturalness. Um, and it comes out just fine. And um, indeed, you might say, but, but wasn't it also pen, pinned by anthropics? Doesn't the pion have something to do with nuclear physics and so on and so on? Well, maybe. So it's hard to disentangle these considerations, but, but anyway. This is only pure math at this point. There's no anthropic role there that can come in. Okay, fast forward to our situation. We just want the analog of this, okay? Um, and the answer is, how do I do this? Okay, I guess I got this guy up first. So in our case, we're thinking of the Higgs as some sort of light composite. And the top quark can appear in it. The top quark is like the photon to some extent. Well, actually that's not quite true. The top, the top left has a small epsilon left. But, right, we needed that for the Z to BB bar. But the top right, to get the top quark mass, we had to kind of take maximal. And I told you that when you have maximal mixing with the strong dynamics, you are part of the strong dynamics. So for all intents and purposes, not only is the Higgs a composite, but the top right is a composite. This is the best fit that we could have with the data. Um, so if you want top left, then top right, okay? So composite line running through the bottom, elementary particle mixing in through the top, Similarly, of course, literally an al analogy with what we did, we could have the W and, uh, and so on. So let's grant that the strong dynamics has a damn good reason why the Higgs is at the bottom of the spectrum, much lighter than the compositeness effects. So that there's a huge hierarchy between the Higgs and the compositeness scale, if only there was no intrusion from the outside. Well, here's the intrusion from the outside. And of course, all it does, you know, things like this, is it just gives us the usual quadratic divergence that we all agonize over, but cut off by the compositeness scale. So where you would have said cut off, we just say compositeness, okay? There's the possibility of cancellations, okay? I mean, the thing that's giving these things finite depends on the details of the composite theory. So, these are only very crude estimates. They could cancel, et cetera, et cetera. The lambda comp that cuts off this may not be exactly the lambda comp that cuts off this. So there's a chance of cancellations, but if you don't believe in fine cancellations, you would say, as Nemo pointed out yesterday, the compositeness scale, the cutoff, the new physics should show up at half a TV, okay? Now, as I'll point out in a bit, um, we knew before we started the LHC that that was incredibly unlikely. Um, and indeed, therefore, I'm, I'm no more depressed about compositeness, as to paraphrase Nima's statements about Susie. I'm no more depressed about compositeness post-LHC than I was pre, okay? I mean, this is, this is the structure. If you are just saying that it's 100% natural, that's the situation. On the other hand, if you say that the compositeness scale is at three TeV, what I called my optimistic scenario, 
Well, that's a challenge for the LHC, but it'll be a really exciting thing when we ramp up to full energy to go for that, okay? But that will still correspond. If you, if you are holding out that hope, that requires a cance cancellations among this and any other contributions like this um, of about 3%, okay? So cancellations to win 3%, one part in 30 cancellation of some sort. If you're holding out for 10 TeV, you're literally holding out, you're holding out partly for a new collider, um, then, not necessarily, maybe, maybe there's some precision tests that we can do. But if you're holding out for 10 TeV, then, then, then you are believing it's plausible to have a quarter percent cancellation in all these contributions for no reason that we currently understand, okay? Um, so this fact that indeed you can solve the hierarchy problem if you just have TeV scale composites, well, that's how compositeness solves the, fine, the, 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 the big hierarchy problem. The fact that we have enough precision tests to tell us that that's not what's happening, and in fact we have a good deal of LHC data if you're literally talking about one TeV, that the fact that that's not likely, that's what we call the little hierarchy problem. In fact, everything I've told you about this story and this way of thinking about naturalness is true even if I didn't believe in compositeness because there is a compositeness of last resort, and it's called the Planck scale, okay? Because in some meaningful sense, there's no distance shorter than the Planck length. Any particles probed by Planck wavelengths will walk and talk to some hypothetical experimentalist. They would walk and talk like composites. In string theory, at the Planck scale, it's literally true. They're composites of strings. They have the same kind of weird form factors and so on that we associate with compositeness. So, in fact, this is really just giving a concrete way of thinking about um, naturalness in general, okay? Okay, so before I talk about any of the phenomenology, um, I wanted to ask, this is a set of hand-waving things. I want this, I want this, I want this to mix with this, I would like all these things to happen. It's a wish list even at that level, you can put it to test. It's a wish list, but it's not obvious that this wish list is self-consistent, okay? In fact, my sense, now, it, having been in this game for a long time, is that often enough the worry you have with many people who give their wish lists for strong dynamics is that they are internally inconsistent, quite apart from whether they're realized in nature. Just internally, mathematically inconsistent. How can we hold this to account, okay? We'd like some systematic approach. Okay. So let's ask a more modest question. When we write the chiral Lagrangian of pi on physics, say, as described by George I's book or reading the original Weinberg papers on the subject, is the chiral Lagrangian a model, a sort of toy model of strong dynamics? And the answer is no. <laughs> it's a it's a systematic expansion, sort of guaranteed to be true under some preconditions. One, you must have spontaneous symmetry breaking, so you have some Goldstone bosons. Two, there should be a gap in the spectrum. Of course the Goldstone bosons have to be massless or light. But you have to assume that everybody who doesn't have a reason to be massless is not massless. This is sort of being very reasonable. The Rho meson, has no reason to be massless, you have to assume, of course you can look at the data, but if you don't look at the data, you have to assume that the rho meson is not light. As soon as you say that there's a gap in the spectrum like that, and you give the fact of chiral symmetry breaking, the chiral Lagrangian follows from unitarity and you know, all the good, you know, all the good axioms of light. So, the chiral Lagrangian in that sense is not some sort of toy model you sort of cobble together. It's the systematic approach to studying the hypothesis that there is spontaneous symmetry breaking. Boom, okay? We would like some sort of systematic expansion that follows from saying, I need operators which mix with the standard model, elementary particles, et cetera, and, and, and just having some systematic expansion, okay? Now, The right way to think about this 
intermediate. Of course, if I tell you that the chiral Lagrangian is internally consistent, which it is, does that tell me that the chiral Lagrangian is renormalizable? Heck no, it's not renormalizable. Does it tell me that there is some UV theory like QCD which reduces to the chiral Lagrangian at low energies? No, there's no guarantee that such a thing exists, but it is the first pass of internal consistency that I can write the chiral Lagrangian, okay? That the rules are internally consistent. We're looking for that. Um, in fact, what level of effectiveness do we want in this effective theory for testing internal consistency? And the best way to frame what I'm shooting for is to imagine yourselves at the end of this century, okay? So we're sitting, heck, I'm more optimistic, 2050, okay? We're sitting, basking in the glory of our 100 TeV collider studies, which are way above some 10 TeV compositeness scale, and we're saying, you know, what kind of description do I want of this compositeness physics? What do I want to know? I'm just an experimentalist. I don't want to, don't tell me too much. And so, of course, that's exactly like us with respect to ordinary compositeness in QCD. We're at energies way bigger than that, and we ask, I'm an experimentalist, what do I need to know? Well, actually, you need to know a lot about the low energy physics. You need to know a lot about the pions and the protons and the lowest lying resonances and so on and so on, because that does pertain to your experiment. That's the bottom line alphabet in which things come out of a collision, okay? So you smack things together in an E plus E minus machine, which is to say particles not dominantly composite, and then you get various jets coming off, okay, quarks and gluons turning into jets, and then these things hadronize in some way, so I'm gonna put hadronization here, on a scale of one, and after a time of one over lambda QCD. And so, let me just, sorry Michelangelo, I'm taking over your lectures. This is it. <laughs> so, this is my understanding. <laughs> now you have it in detail. If you didn't like that very coarse grained view that Michelangelo gave you, this is it. Um, so, you get your pions and your protons and your omesons. Now, you clearly want to know something about the exclusive information, meson by delicate meson, proton by proton, properties here. You'd like to describe them. But when you get to really high energies, way above 10 TeV, or way above 1 GeV in a lepton collider, I don't need to know that, that's why we invented jets. I don't need to know about every exclusive final state. There were three protons here and five pions there. I mean, that would be nice, but I don't need to at first pass. I have a kind of inclusive, I'd like to have some sort of inclusive picture of where the energy goes, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of some sort of picture of collect large collections of hadrons, and then a kind of, at least at low energies, when I'm thinking about the calorimeter, this, that, and the other, I might want to think about the exclusive properties below, or of order lambda comp, and inclusive properties above lambda comp. It would be pretty good if you had a picture that at least captured this much and told you about the internal consistency. It's even better than the chiral Lagrangian, which actually only tells you about processes below the compositeness scale, okay? Want even that. So that's what you'd like. But we don't yet have, I mean, you have not yet heard me say the right small parameter that allows us to do this miracle of actually capturing this so that we can do a lot of these things in more detail. So let's list our small parameters. There's this expansion. And let's list, there's a funny spectrum, it's very abstract, which is we have a list of operators that we need to mix with are elementary particles. So what I'm gonna list here is not the energy spectrum, I'm gonna list the scale dimension spectrum. Anomalous dimensions are significant at strong coupling. There are canonical dimensions that operators have, the engineering dimensions for you, you can work out. A four fermion operator has dimension six. But with anomalous dimensions, it changes to some 
dynamically determined dimensionality. So we have some operators, for example, if we don't want Yukawa couplings to be ridiculously small, they're already ridiculously small in my opinion, look at the electron Yukawa, if we don't want them to be even more ridiculously small, then we want these operators that I'm mixing with, we don't want this to have a dimension too different from four, okay? But that means this has some sort of, let me be sloppy, this has some sort of order one dimensions. So if this is dimension one, then there are some sort of low-lying operators that we need just, to, just so that our story makes any sense. And then when we said this, we said that we had to gauge the standard model subgroup of flavor symmetries in the, in the composite sector. So we needed some J mu's. So, you know, there's some J mu's. And J mu, of course, famously conserved currents have dimension three, exactly. So we gotta have some operators which have dimension, which are order one. There's no choice. What we want tells us to do this. What about all the other operators you could write down? In a comp you know, you can write composite operators, you can write operators of any dimension in engineering units, and then they can get dressed by strong dynamics and turn into anything. Just like to get the chiral Lagrangian, I assume that there's a big gap between the pion and the rho meson, and then I get the chiral Lagrangian as a theorem, okay? Let's assume that the guys that we have to have are separated by the other operators that haven't played a part in our story so far. Let's suppose they're separated in, in scale dimension. This is a dimensionless thing, scale dimension. Let's suppose they're separated by a gap which is called a scale dimension gap. And let's suppose that this gap is big. You know, in the renormalization group, when operators have, or interactions have very high dimension, they are so-called irrelevant, and they rapidly become irrelevant to keep track of. So that's a good idea. Let's see if we can generalize this idea of the renormalization group and say, there is a bunch of other operators that must be there, but let's hope, let's hope like crazy that they're not that relevant so that this gap is big. That gives me one more small parameter. As I said, you can find a new small parameter then then, then you're really in business. Um, so the claim is, with these two small parameters, there is a systematic result for all these ideas that I've just been using squiggles to say, okay? And uh, the that, that the systematics of this expansion in this way of thinking tells you that you can geometrize the strong dynamics. Strong dynamics full of abstract considerations and imponderables, et cetera, et cetera. Just like QCD has got strong coupling at one GV. But somehow you can geometrize. The chiral Lagrangian kind of has an element of geometry. You have these sort of nonlinear field manifolds. It's very beautiful. You can play around with it. It's certainly worth doing. The CCWZ construction, it's all emergent from just being a Goldstone boson. There's a general, there's a magnificent generalization of that kind of thinking that geometrizes the strong dynamics considerations and gives you a systematic expansion with these two things. And that expansion, and, and, and this geometrization is precisely one way of reading the famous ADS-CFT correspondence, okay? And if you want my own version of saying that, thinking of it from this point of view as opposed to the historical way it's come about, you can take a look at my uh, semi-review here, but that'll again contain other reviews and references and so on, okay? So just thinking of it as just like the granddaddy of all chiral Lagrangians, okay? Um, and what does it turn all of this into? When I say it geometrizes the problem, it geom what, where's the geometry? I live in Minkowski space. What's there to talk about? The LHC is just sitting in Minkowski space. It geometrizes by turning everything into extra dimensions. 
and the pattern of Yukawa couplings we get there just turns into the story of wave function overlaps in one extra dimension, et cetera, et cetera. So it leads you, it leads you to the RS picture or warped um, extra dimensions picture of standard model in an extra dimension and so on and so on, okay? I'm not going to go through that at all. I'm just telling you it exists and I'm telling you the deep concepts are the ones that I quickly sketched, but the RS thing then should not be thought of, again, you can vary the model because you can vary, just like you can vary chiral Lagrangian depending on the pattern of breaking this, that, and the other. You can vary the model here, but in a sense, its significance is that it is a systematic expansion, keeping track of the elements of the game that you insist on and assuming that you have a large enough gap that allows you to do the systematic expansion. So you're not anymore just making up random squiggles. Maybe the world doesn't have these things, but we got somewhere to start, at least, to play around with these ideas. So, so, so that's where that sits um, in the game, okay? And because it's geometric, a lot of considerations become visual, and the statement that I made yesterday that when rewritten in, those, in that language and you fit to the data, you get this picture that the world that we inhabit what I call four-dimensional cosmos with all its intricate Yukawa structure has come from five-dimensional chaos, some five-dimensional gauge theory and gravity and you throw it into this five-dimensional waveguide, stir the parameters of the theory and out comes something structured like um, the four-dimensional world we see. Okay, that is without the appropriate fine print but, 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 but that's how we should, I think about it. Um, okay, I want to um, just say a little bit about uh, mm, yeah, let me try and say something about unification briefly and then something briefly about the kinds of physics that, because there's something qualitatively interesting about the LHC physics, should we be lucky enough to see some of these guys? And, you know, this is, I'm being super fast in saying this. It could be that some of the resonances are this heavy and some of them are 1.5 TV. The LHC, you live and die by whether something is 2 TV or 1 TV, okay? So order one matters. And so it's just possible that we're gonna see, we're gonna see things like this at the LHC. And um, I wanna say something about what they look like, but let me just finish what I started in the the question time yesterday where I said, I went through the, um, what I said about unification yesterday and how unification becomes still possible, taking, not, not, not possible in the tune sense, but possible in a, that you can sort of keep the virtues of the standard model of unification by, by just taking the new strong dynamics to cancel out of the differential running that determines whether you unify or not. How? By just taking the flavor symmetry of the strong dynamics quite plausibly to be unified, okay? Now, I'll just say it quickly, but the reference with the references inside is, is this, where you wanna say what's the error bars and blah, 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 blah. But, but, but let me just say it quickly. It's not quite, it's not quite that you have to do this and then you have to do the standard model. That's not quite the story. Because the Higgs boson is actually here. It's part of the strong dynamics. So I should take it away from the standard model. I should take standard model minus the Higgs boson. But then, the best fit with the data would suggest that you should also think of the top quark, the right-handed top quark, as a composite as well. So it's already included here. You should not be including it here, okay? So, um, so this thing does not affect differential running. This does. Let's just take a quick peek 
at, uh, at what this does, okay? Um, can we have the uh, slide, please? Drum roll. No, 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 that's not it. Wait. That's the MSSM. Just to remind you, just to remind you. Okay. So it's this. Now, I had to only show you differential running, okay, because I needed to cancel out this strong interaction uncertainty called the strong, the, the, the strong running, which overall accepts it. So I just subtracted the strong running the one over, so this is one over alpha one minus one over alpha three, one over alpha two minus one over alpha three, one over alpha three minus one over alpha three. But the fact of unification, et cetera, et cetera, it actually improves significantly on the standard model. Um, oddly enough, uh, if you actually insist that SU5 is to the strong dynamics what isospin is to QCD, then this is actually a little bit wrong if you think of the top right as a composite, because the top right can't be a composite of an SU5 global symmetry because it doesn't fill out a complete representation. Okay. So there have to be other composites, there have to be other elementary guys, but that gives you a sharp prediction in terms of the differential running. When the dust settles, we can talk about it later because I'm running out of time, it tells you you actually should be algebraic. For differential running purposes, you should actually be subtracting two times the top right. And uh, in that case, this is the picture. Now, you have to ask historically. Now, first, the error bars are bigger than the MSSM. Don't fool yourself into thinking, this, so this is a total coincidence. No significance to the fact that it looks that good, but, but the error bars are bigger, and they're probably, my best guess, there's this big uncertainty called the strong interactions, which are telling you whether you hit Landau poles or not. I'll briefly mention that next time. But other than that, the best guess is that at best, you could ever hope to be error bars, which are maybe twice the size of the threshold corrections that you need in, um, in SUSY. Here, you actually don't need some twice the size of threshold correction, but, but, but they're there whether you like it or not. Okay, so, but it's comparable to SUSY unification in that sense. Maybe there are some imponderables here that are not there in a perturbative theory. Um, just to say that uh, this does not happen. So when Nima and collaborators wrote their split SUSY paper, we had been playing with running in RS models for a while and um, and I remember saying to my colleagues, damn him, <laughs> he's always lucky. He just does this dumb thing, you know, split Susie for God's sake, and it still unifies, you know? How come we can't get that lucky? Um, so, uh, but within a day, uh, and, and that's because we had just been doing it with just standard model running. We hadn't, we hadn't properly figure out who was composite and who was not. But within a day, my colleagues had, uh, had, had, had done it, and, and then they came, they came and showed me this, okay? So it was not something you have a choice of which calculation to do, but so does it mean something? I don't know, you know? That I would not give this as high a grade as MSSM unification. I don't know why. Maybe I'm underselling it, but it didn't have to be like this, and it can easily, and the rules are fairly tight. Um, I'm not sure if we somehow secretly knew what answer. I, I certainly did not know what answer we wanted before we did the calculation and found out. Okay. Um, can we raise that uh, slide again? Um, so, so let me say this fast. I, I, so there's a lot of estimates you can do, but the state, the fact that that works in any way depends on how much, not the differential running, but the overall running certainly depends on the strong dynamics, okay? So this B strong 
certainly determines that. And if you have n hypercolors, then this will be proportional to that, because every particle in the loop here that contributes to standard model running goes like that. So if this is too big, then this running, which is non-asymptotically free, will drive you to a Landau pole and tell you that the one loop calculations I just did are not the leading story at all, and it would be a disaster. So if you want this kind of story to make sense, then it's, okay. So the proportionality constants, co coefficients order one. Well, the order one things really matter. But a rough estimate, I was gonna do it, but I've run out of time. Um, a rough estimate would be that you should think of this n hypercolor, as I said, as, as sort of being very roughly order 10, and you should think of um, good enough to do some sort of one over n expansion. And you should think of, you know, the four pi over root n's, you know, as, well, whatever. Roughly three, could be two, whatever, okay. Um, just, just to give you a flavor for it. Um, so I just wanted to say a word about uh, and, and just quickly give the references that I think get you to the rest of it, about the pheno before, before we actually um, stop. Uh, I, guess, I guess I want a big board, but what can I do in this time? Uh, so, so there's an obvious set of composites. The composites that we want to see phenomenologically are those that have the same quantum numbers. Uh, well, they're interpolated by the operators that mix with the standard model elementary particles. In other words, the composites have the same quantum numbers as the standard model. That's why you can get away with an extra dimensional RS description, because these particles, these composites interpolating interpolated by the operators that mix with the standard model, since they have the same standard model quantum numbers, they're the same as uh, standard model particles that they mix with, okay? They look like excited standard model particles, excitations of the standard model, and in fact, in the extra dimensional geometric picture, they are just described by the kaluza klein excitations of the standard model particles. So there's a reason why the quantum numbers match up. Um, and these states are narrow. When I say narrow, I mean narrow in the one over n sense of the word, which is not all that narrow, but it is technically narrow. That is, they are resonances. The large n predicts that they are resonances. And so they have an individuality which we can seek out at the LHC, bumps, okay? Um, the quickest place I know to get a sense of all the different types, to put your arms around all the sort of central kinds of phenomenology here um, is in this, uh, in this paper. Um, but let me just quickly sketch it out so you can have quarks inside the proton, they don't couple very much to the new resonances, but the gluons, the virtual gluons can mix with excited gluons, therefore sometimes called the kaluza klein in RS language, they're called the kaluza klein gluon, and often that is what the experiments quote, but you can just think of it as a composite, a rho meson of the strong interactions. And so this is something that can be done. You can resonantly produce this particle at the LHC, even though the light fermions don't like to talk to the composite physics, they don't mix very much with it, but you can go through the gauge interactions in this way. Um, and then this thing can decay. Now here's the rule about decays. You want to decay back to the standard model, but the guys who talk most to the strong dynamics are the ones with the biggest epsilons. The particles with the biggest epsilons are those with the biggest masses in the standard model. And so it's the top quark or the bottom quark. If you have to go leptonically for some structural reason, it's gonna be taus. Because the gauge bosons mix with currents, with gauge coupling strength, the epsilon is order the 
coupling, the gauge couplings. So you'll also have Ws and, and Zs, but in particular, the longitude on Ws and Zs are actually secretly the Eaton Higgs degree of freedom, which is a composite, right? So you do couple strongly to that. And even the Higgs scalar is also a, one of these guys. So these are the new final states that matter. You might like to see the muon, light jets, et cetera, et cetera, but you're gonna get heavy flavor, you're gonna get all these things, for better or worse, this is what you got. These things, a lot of these heavy particles, they don't just stay as a single jet, they would typically break up, flower into many decay products, leptons and, and quarks. Um, but there's already something qualitatively interesting. The top quark that comes as a decay product here is not your grandfather's top quark. The, the Tevatron, a top quark decay, would look sort of all the decay products going in different angles. Because we are necessarily, as gamblers, thinking about fairly massive resonances, for them, the top quark is almost a massless particle, which is to say that it's a very light particle, and all the things that normally would flower out in its decay products are actually boosted into a narrow cone. And so this thing, when it decays, goes into so-called top jets, okay? Almost a single entity and one tries to distinguish it with new techniques, these so-called boosted, uh, looking for boosted structure in these uh, fat jets. When that, and that has become a new um, technique, if you like, for looking at decays that result in these heavy particles. You can talk about W jets and so on, or even this as a jet, okay? Um, so there's an in, in, sort of an interesting challenge when you can no longer isolate the lepton in the, t in the top decay and so on, and you're using a different type of set of techniques to filter out these interesting collections of jets from the random background type of jet, okay? Um, so this is the spirit of a lot of these things. Um, other things that could have happened to this guy is it, it could have actually gone to some sort of um, excited top quark, which then goes to a top and say, a Higgs. The Higgs is the new interesting final state, okay? Things can decay into the Higgs, okay? It has a preferred reason to talk to the strong dynamics. Um, so this gives you a, a quick sense of it. There are special situations in which you can have leptons being produced, even though even the heaviest lepton is not that heavy. If lepton number is playing an important role, then that can actually get produced, in which case you can go into leptons and even special situations where the lighter leptons get uh, populated. Um, you can also have single production of a resonance. For example, a fermionic resonance. There are bottom quarks inside the proton, PDFs. Not big, but they're there. And there are even W, longitudinal Ws, sitting inside the proton PDFs, okay? If you want to think of it as a PDF. Um, so you can actually have things like this coming from the protons. And, and you can produce singly something like these excited tops, which then go to top and Higgs or top and Z longitudinal or, or whatever, okay? So there's a whole smattering of that. You can sort of get a sense for it here. Um, a lot of these are reported in various places in the experiments. And this just gives you a quick sense for how to think about them and what makes them sort of, their characteristics interesting, the sort of boosted structure of what would normally be these very heavy particles decaying almost, you know, without great, uh, non without great relativistic speeds, are, they're now super relativistic particles at, at, at the LHC if, if they're there. Okay, I better stop, I think. Is that, isn't, isn't that right, Scott? This is a good time to, yeah. So, let me pause and take up tomorrow. Um, tomorrow, just to say what it's about, mm, I'm gonna say a little bit about the Higgs, but mostly just to quickly give you some references. And, and, um, and I wanted to shift gear into a little bit about anthropics, sorry, got to do it, and a little bit about the worst cases. For example, what if you don't see all this great stuff at the LHC? 
Is there nothing to see? If you're going to see something else, how would you gamble on it? Even if you believe this picture and all these resonances are 10 TeV or 20 TeV, does that mean you see nothing? How should you think about it, okay? How should you organize taking flavor into account, etc.? where you would bet on the phenomena of the LHC, where to go hunting. That's what I'd like to do in my last lecture. Um, 